no matter how bad things appear, um, you're always looking for the nugget of gold or the, the seed of the future that's going to come out of whatever the event is. And when you start looking in the world, looking at the world that way, um, you see just so many seeds of the future begging to be germinated. Yeah, you know? nice. And then, you know, as time moves on, you see more and more people germinating all sorts of different seeds. That was Hamish Mackay, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an eighth generation Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day, super excited to be um, releasing uh, this week now a uh, interview I did with Hamish Mackay a few months ago now. Um, for those who don't know, Hamish and I uh, have been running biodynamic workshops together for some years now and um, our uh, I, I met Hamish oh, 15 or so years ago um, as part of my regenerative journey um, doing a holistic farm management course and as a result of being involved in that group of farmers meeting Hamish and what Hamish brought to my life was um, a sense of my place in nature and my farm and my purpose and uh, has, has played since then a significant role uh, as a mentor. So um, in this interview, we went all over the place. We talked about um, you know, the, the, the impact of COVID on, on the world. We talked about um, uh, what, you know, one sense of purpose. Uh, we talked about nutrition. We talked about mental health. Uh, we talked about the adoption or the adaption of, um, of regenerative practices, the state of regenerative farming in the world at this at this point in time, and um, and weave that all into Hamish's own regenerative journey. So, um, without further ado, I hope you enjoy as much as I did this interview with Hamish Mackay. Hamish, take two. <laughs> We've been. Um, I'm joined by Hamish Mackay uh, on the regenerative journey. Keen to understand your regenerative journey, Hamish. But first, uh, just to set the scene a bit, we're sitting in the Hanamino Garden. We've just spent half an hour trying to find a sheltered spot. We hope that we can maintain the no wind content. What you're looking at is uh, well, part of our garden, I guess. After a very challenging summer, um, it's come good. And we'll, we'll, we might hint along the way as to what we did to make it come good, uh, apart from the Apart from the rain, the, the life saving rain. Hey, Mish, um, so you might hear, yeah, so you might hear the odd bird noise and cat wandering in the background, God knows what. Hey, Mish, um, let's start at the beginning of your regenerative journey. Where did that all begin? Okay, well, first, thank you very much and congratulations on a Land Care Award. Well, well deserved. And uh, from what I've seen, you've been putting it to great use. Thank you. Around the country. And- and basically speaking about regenerative agriculture out of your own experience, and that's where it's really, um, that's where it catches fire, so to speak. So my journey, um, I, I call Braidwood home. Um, oh, it'd be right. And oh, she needs moving. Yeah, I <laughs> We've call, got the lanes. I called Braidwood home. Um, we had a sheep and cattle property, a family property there. I'm a younger brother, so my older brother uh, ran the family farm. And, He's actually been my major mentor through the whole of my life. He, he notices things, um, pays attention to them, and um, points me in the direction I need to go. Mm. And sometimes he kicks me in the butt too, but it's all good stuff. We all need one of them. So, um, and, you know, we had a good education. As Andrew says, um, it took two bales of wool to put him through a year at Geelong Grammar at school. So. Just an indication, his son was going to cost 112 bales of wool. 
So agriculture has taken, in terms of trade, a major hit uh, over the generation, so to speak. And I had that education and it was fantastic, but nothing made sense. All the bits of information, history or maths or science or what have you. And I just left school totally confident that um, whatever it was in my life, I'd meet it and get on with it. So I went to university. I travelled first all over Australia. That was fantastic. Um, not in the regenerative agriculture space at all in those days, just a young uh, lad travelling. Um, university economics um, didn't make sense. Again, my brother rang me a year or so ago and said the latest um, fashionable economist of current times was saying exactly the same as, as I said when I left the university in 1968. I can't remember what it was, but um, I travelled on overseas, you know, working, sort of backpacking sort of work. Came back to Australia, went back to the farm, I worked out what to do next. And Andrew had invited Alex Podolinski to our farm. And Alex was the sort of um, go-to for biodynamics in those days, back in the 70s. And he, as soon as I heard him speaking, I knew that's what I'd been waiting for. So for me, it was a fairly cut and dry. I'm just traveling through life waiting for it to happen. It happened. I got on with it. So um, I didn't go and work with him immediately. I, I was um, drawn into the wool business. We, ch we changed economic wool producers changed the way wool was sold. So I saw how difficult it is to change uh, agriculture. It takes 20 to 30 years. It takes a generation. Um, then I got moved to Sydney, and then I joined the Demeter Bakery, which was the first sort of whole mill, stone ground, uh, biodynamic bakery in the country. If you go back to the 1970s, all brown bread was basically white bread dyed. <laughs> dyed. <laughs> unless you got wog, wog bread from the back streets of Marrickville. Um, Good, good boarding school brown bread. Yep. So, um, <laughs> along with the whole Whitlam experience, in one sense, um, that generation of us all thought all we had to do was show people something worked and everyone would do it. But actually, change doesn't quite happen like that. So, you know, Whitlam tried to do too much too fast. We tried to do too much too fast and ran into the same problems. So, um, that's a little bit why I do what I do now because. Um, it takes time to change, and you have to let the change unfold in its own time. So you've got to be putting it out there and putting it out there and putting it out there. And it's like with your children. You know, often you put it out there, you put it out there, you do what you can, nothing seems to happen, and suddenly they uh, wake up at 35 or whatever and do amazing things. Can I just jump in there? For two, two, two reasons, Hamish, let's try this without the socks on. Just running with a, excuse me, there we go, the socks off. I wonder whether that's going to make any difference to that little bit of background. We've got some poplars um, in the background. You probably can't see them. I'm not sure if that's any better. It might be a little better. But I think we're not in the wind anymore, so let's get rid of the, the purple <coughs> socks. And the other thing too, I have to say, and I totally agree with what you just said there, Hamish, because I remember when I was at school, boarding school, mum would drag me to nurseries and antique shops. And I just couldn't have think, thought of a worse thing to do. And then the interesting thing is, I'll be you know, in my thirties. I started having a real interest in old, you know, furniture and trinkets and things, and also, in, and I just can't. I, lo I love trees and gardening. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, what what goes around comes around, and it's a wonderful way that um, we develop um, our personalities and our interests over time. So yeah, totally agree. So one of the things there is that um, you know I, I call my little side of the business Biodynamics Twenty Twenty Four because. For the last 30 or 40 years, uh, 2024 is the date I have in destiny that Australia, Australia's agriculture will be totally different. I'm not saying it'll all be biodynamic, but it'll be what we now call regenerative. And I think the publication of Charlie Massey's book, The uh, Call of the Reed Warbler, I believe history will show the publication of that book will mark, be marked as the turning point from one generation of agriculture to a new generation of agriculture. So. I feel we're on track time-wise. And this is where, when Alex Podolinski introduced me to biodynamics and spiritual science, it, it all just made sense of everything I'd learned at school. So nothing was wasted. It was just um, like putting the jigsaw together and you see a totally different picture. And it's just exciting because um, no matter how bad things appear, 
um, you're always looking for the nugget of gold or the, the seed of the future that's going to come out of whatever the event is. And when you start looking in the world, looking at the world that way, um, you see just so many seeds of the future begging to be germinated. Yeah, you know? nice. And then, you know, as time moves on, you see more and more people germinating all sorts of different seeds. And so Charlie Massey's book is, in a way, um, if you just look at biodynamics or permaculture or natural sequence farming, you've got all these little groups. But actually what Charlie's done is actually presented the big picture. And when you start to see all these different groups, uh, all these little tributaries, and suddenly we've got a stream and suddenly we've got a river and suddenly we've got an ocean of chain. Yeah, and that's where we're up to. And we're right on that turning point. And the critical thing about the turning point is that that's the other side of where we can go or fail is suddenly everyone wants to change, but the skill base isn't there. So my mission for the last 30 years is to make sure in every region, every shire, um, there's someone who knows about biodynamics. So if through whatever environmental emergency or what have you, there are people who know what to do. In other words, to apply biodynamics is extraordinarily easy for a lot of people to get their head around it is the opposite. And I don't have any issue with that. It is, it is hard work. Yeah, to try and get your head around what it's really all about. The actual doing of it, collecting cow shit, putting it in cow horns, burying it, stirring it, putting it out, no, no difficulty. So if we get to a really hard, challenging environmental p- place, if we've got people all around the countryside who know what to do, we can, we can spread, the, spread the practice very quickly. So that's, that's where I look at it as a, as a sort of... Um, it's environmental security for the country. Um, if we don't have such a, a um, sort of negative viewpoint uh, and we don't have some sort of environmental emergency, then the people who are doing biodynamics will be producing a, a quality food that the consumers love um, for the taste. And so it'll be a premium product and their, their costs will be significantly lower than anyone else so to me no environmental emergency there'll be a gravitation to quality and if there's an environmental emergency we'll have the capacities to address that that um, emergency so that's really what i've been doing from the bakery point of view back in the 70s and 80s part of what was the limitation there apart from our own limitations was that there weren't enough people growing enough produce to expand the business. To have bigger, better biodynamic bakeries, you need bigger, better biodynamic farms. So that's why the first thing before we start to go back down the consumer end and tell the consumers the benefits of good food, you first got to have the farmers growing. Yeah, so there's a whole... And all of these things are starting to flow. You know, it's really exciting. There's, <clears throat> there are people now looking for quality food and there are people growing quality food. And um, it's still a trickle in that sense, but I'm relaxed. We, we just keep the trickles coming and it'll gradually turn into a stream and um, it'll be a more interesting stream. So we're on track. And Hamish, getting back to your, your journey, um what was a bit of a turning point for you? What was, the, what was the moment you went from a conventional upbringing or sort of career path to, you know... It was, it was that day pitch. Alex Podolinski came. He showed us our farm through something we knew. He showed it to us through totally different eyes. Mm. Yeah? And it, that sort of um, what is familiar is also then something new. And that's really exciting because then it's what I start to see in it that is the leading point. Um, and as I say, that led me to the Demeter Bakery where we're trying to get this. You know, the idealism was quite strong in those days. And as I say, my brother was back at the farm doing that end of it. So I was sort of out, out the next level. So what was it about Alex going to the farm? What did he highlight? What, did he, what, did he, what light did he sh- sh- shine on your farm or you that really got you thinking there's something in this? Just in a practical, physical 
since. Um, we walked around the farm with a shovel in our hands and dug holes and had a look at the soil. Mm. Yeah, we'd never actually. Um, I knew from from work with Peter Hutchins and people at the CSIRO that there was a sort of statistical balance. You, you needed to have the same weight of life under the soil as on top of the soil. But that was a that was a an interesting sort of uh, for not abstract concept. But we've never actually gone and looked at actually what the soil looks like and who's living there and saying good day to it sort of thing. So just that whole um, Starting to investigate under the soil, and, you know, I'm talking about 1972, which this was you know, right outside the spectrum in those days. There were there were people in the Henry Doubleday um, Society, you know, that was a soil, and there was um, I think there was a, a soil association. There were there were these sort of odd bods out of out of the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, who were sort of quite uh, way ahead of their time. But they'd sort of, that's where they'd got to. This, I, I couldn't relate to them, but Alex was a practicing farmer at a dairy farm in Victoria and um, producing high quality milk, being economic. And again, this is the beginning of the 70s. The, the 60s saw the first wave. <laughs> That's true. Excuse me. The 60s saw the first wave of, of um, people exiting. Act- Agriculture. When when Britain went into the then common market, that changed all our markets because, again, people probably forget that we used to pay more for our butter in Sydney than we paid for, paid for Australian butter in London. Yeah, so, um, same with mutton and what have you. So we were we were in the sort of gold standard days. Um, so all these dairy farms up and down the east coast, um, everything was um, small scale family farms producing lots of stuff that all was very important for our terms of trade. Britain joined the common market and that was the beginning of a whole um, change in the financial structuring of agriculture. And the 60s saw the first wave of people leaving the dairy industry, so to speak. In, in Australia? Or in, or Australia, in Australia. Yeah. And what happened then, some, some just quietly left because actually – if you look at more deeply, they were farmers by um, family. They just take on the family farm, or they came back from the Second World War and they got a soldier settler block and grew this or that. But when the pressure came on, they weren't really farmers at heart. Yeah, right. yeah. Didn't have the passion or the. And the ones that were farmers at heart were the people that found their way to people like Podolinsky, because um, no matter how wacky it sounded. If this was a way they could survive as being a dairy farmer, they would do anything. Yeah, yeah. and so um, this is still happening today. There are farmers who are there because of family history, not because it's in their blood, in their destiny to be a farmer. It's just that's where destiny placed them, and um, it, it's comfortable enough to keep doing it when it gets too uncomfortable. Um, they either walk away or get sold up or you know, end up doing something else, which usually they're much happier doing. And you end up with then people coming out of the city who are coming the reverse way. They are real farmers at heart, but they've actually come through the city starting point. It's an interesting point, Hamish, um, in being involved with um, some organisations that are helping to train farmers, current farmers, to look at their business, look at themselves, look at their family situation and 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 you know, I guess trying to find a not necessarily a balance between work and family, but just to acknowledge that you are a family working in a business. Um, and my experience has been that quite a few farmers, through that um, uh, that process of standing back and looking at the situation, really identifying their values and what they want to do, um, and try and put aside the legacy of having had the farm or being a sixth generation farmer. Um, quite a few of them actually come to the the understanding that um, you know, they don't actually want to be a farmer, but, and, they, and, they, and then and then there's a whole sort of um, there's a conflict of you know what is that if I'm not a farmer who am I and what will Dad say and what am I what what legacy will I leave if I'm not leaving a farm and and it's a really challenging um, 
situation for people to be in. A, a good one, I think, ultimately, but it's going to be really uh, a real challenge for them and their families and, and the legacy that they would like to leave. leave. Well, one of the, one of the sort of um, aspects of working with Biodemic, which is founded on spiritual science, and just to say spiritual science is using a scientific methodology, the conventional scientific me- methodology, but applying it to things that aren't sort of immediately visible. Yep. Yep. And so um, within our lexicon, there's a, we live at a time when there's a changing, there's been a change in the, the, the zeitgeist in the ruling time spirit, so to speak. So if we recognize that and work with that, um, we can end up with a different place. To give you an example, the previous time spirit was a, a being a form. Yeah, so we have all these forms of government, church, family, business. It's all top-down um, bloodline stuff. Um, and since um, the 20th century, all of those old forms are disintegrating and new new dynamics are arising. And so it's less likely now that people will um, sort of incarnate into a family because they're a farmer and they want to be a farmer. They'll be more incarnating because they're looking for a body that will actually um, be healthy enough for them to do what they want to do. And so that might sound quite sort of abstract to a lot of people, and I totally understand that, but if you, that's where the work comes to try and understand that. And then you start to see there are we had a, we had a person at a workshop and he um, was laughing because he had a 12-year-old daughter um, and she wouldn't swear. You know? And he tried to pay her $20 to swear, whatever. And that's all fun, but I look at that situation. There's a guy, they're living right out in the boondocks you know, in a really clean environment you know, in terms of Wi-Fi and, and just sort of the social crap that go part of city life, so to speak. So I start to see these kids in these families that are very special people. And so to me, I watch those and see where they're, where, what they're bringing to humanity, so to speak. Whereas the kids being born in cities in the middle of Wi-Fi, and it's a real challenge to actually um, be able to fulfill their destiny. So back to the meeting with Alex Polinski, for me that was a destiny thing. It was what I've been waiting for. And as soon as I met it, I knew that was the, that was the fire. That was the starting gun for my life, so to speak. Other people, we had a lady at a workshop just recently, and she's on a path of search. She's going to all these different groups, trying to find whether it's yoga or whether it's this or whether it's that, and that's a totally valid path too. You know, the point is that she will get to where she needs to be. And just my my message to her: relax and keep keep stepping forward. Um, be as wake as you can to when something something appears that got your name on it, then pick that up and go with it. Hamish, just on that, and, and I guess people, children finding their destiny um, and identifying, you know, potentially the differences in, in opportunity to do that between children growing up in an urban area, you know, uh, and, and, I, and I guess I define that uh, in, you know, in one simple way as being less attached to nature potentially versus children who are growing up in the country where they're, they're pretty much in nature every day. How can those children in those urban areas, um, you know, with, whether it's a destiny thing or it's just a, um, a happiness thing, you know, how, how can children, and, and more importantly, I guess, parents um, who are essentially in charge of those children, and, the, and their upbringing, you know, how can they um, create, you know, we'll get more in touch with nature? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say this is not about being judgmental. This, this, is, <clears throat> this is a phase of humanity we, in a way we've got to leave nature so that we can actually um, appreciate the, the lack of nature and then go back and find nature again. You know, that's a different thing of just just being born into a beautiful place and living there and whatever and then dying and what have you. But we now live in a time when we've actually got to um, lose everything and then find it again. So 
to answer your question, it can be as simple as making sure children are given access to good, fa- good tasting food. Yep. And you'll be amazed how alert small children are to taste differences. And it's in my generation, it was eat your potatoes and you, know, you sit at the table until you've, until you've eat, finished eating your potatoes. But if you pay it small attention, you might find it's not the potatoes, it's actually just how those potatoes are grown or where they came from, it's more the issue that in my generation we weren't really aware of. A potato is a potato is a potato. But actually, when you start to taste the difference between a biodynamic potato and a chemical potato, um, maybe the children actually have a finer sense of taste than we're giving them credit for. So that's just a very simple thing to make sure we can provide them good tasting food. And this is now a major, major problem because the way our economy has evolved, um, the people down the bottom end of the spectrum find it very difficult to be able to afford food that I'm talking about. It's not impossible. About 20 years ago, and I can't quite the research, but they worked out the people who were interested in buying organic produce were right across the socioeconomic spectrum. It wasn't just wealthy people, but the people down the bottom end of the pile, they knew that a good organic apple would actually be more nourishing and more filling than two chemical ones. So the organic one might be more expensive, but their net food bill, they could actually um, manage. And um, again, I think that's part of what's evolving, people are becoming more aware of value. Um, And that then isn't just something we inherit, we actually have to decide it for ourselves. And that's that's what's going to make the future. And I watch I watch for sort of um these sort of um sparrows in the spring, but in America I heard on the radio the other day there are twenty million women who knit. Cool. Yeah. But the really interesting thing is half of them are under 20. Yeah, right. Yeah, that is really interesting to me because what it seems to be flagging from what I could gather from the talk they were giving is that um, they're starting to look for something that has a value. You can go to Big W or whatever it is and buy something cheap, but it actually has no value on one level. You know, whereas if you knit something or you're given something that was knitted for you, there's a different relationship um, all around. So whether I've got the right message or not, that's what I'm listening for. And it's happening right across the spectrum. There's all sorts of things that are happening. People are joining choirs or, you know, they're over listening to CDs. They actually want to get out there and sing sort of thing. And so how does that relate? I mean, I, I totally agree because um, there's, a, there's a, you know, we are, we are, Beings that want to create stuff, we want to leave a legacy. We want to feel purposeful in our lives. How how do how can farmers apply that to their their farming situation, their property, their landscape? Well, again, each one will come into the spectrum in their through their own path. Like your description of going to a talk on making profit out of drought it was sort of so outrageous. You went for <laughs> went for the comedy show, yeah, <laughs> and suddenly you're on a whole new path. So. Everyone has their own version of that sort of turning point. As I say, it was Alex Podolinsky coming to our farm. In a way, my soul was inherently looking for it. Yeah. In a way, your soul was. You just didn't think you were going to find it there. Mm, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But actually, you found something that was life changing. Um, and it happens, my observation happens, everyone has their moment. Um, it can be through illness, through illness of the, the child, I mean, Graham Sait, Nutritech, you know, that was the outcome of his daughter getting sick. He made, a, he made a, a spiritual commitment between him and his spiritual being, um, God, however he described it, but he made a commitment about the healing of his daughter, and he stuck to the commitment. Mm. Yeah. And he's created an amazing business and an amazing yeah. source of education and yeah. inspiration. And I'm also very clear that... Um, I'm grappling with how do we, how do we bring what biodynamics stands for into the world, um, and you know that has all the challenges of you know being regarded as wacky and all that. 
but it's it's that's my challenge. You know, Graham Sage has brought he's brought another another element which is equally important. Yeah, so that's where we have to then collaborate. Um, I don't see we're in competition. There are some people that can't get their head around biodynamics. Go buy Nutritech stuff. Sure, you know, it's a it's a step towards the future. So the regenerative agriculture movement. Is wonderful about it is there are all now all these different um, threads that are all starting to become manifest as a fabric. Yeah, and the important thing is that you find the thread that you relate to, and the group that you relate to, and get on with that. If we start to become like politicians and just argue against each other for the sake of arguing against each other and all that sort of stuff, um, people are over all that. Yeah. And um, one of the American um, sort of organic gurus whose name escapes me right now, but he made this observation. He said, you know, we all back in the 60s thought this would work. And if, if we did it, everyone would do it. If we showed how to do it, everyone would do it. And he said, it didn't happen that way. And then he said, what happened? The organic movement basically turned in on itself and started arguing amongst ourselves who was – and it was – Totally a waste of space. We should have been just hunkering down and getting on with our own stuff and sharing what we all could could share. And that in the biodynamic movement is what I'm I'm really that's our next phase is to move more from using the preparations to actually how we how we operate socially, how we share our differences. Because we speak about diversity, but then we've got to practice diversity so that um, we're not all going to agree on all things. There are going to be people doing things that I don't agree with or I wouldn't do. Um, or, but the fact that other people are doing it is, is fine as far as I'm concerned. That's their choice. The only person that really can start to make judgments about how you farm is your consumer, your customer. Yeah. They, have a, they, have a valid, they have a valid point in saying, I want my food grown this way or that way. That's totally right. But in when I teach biodynamics, um, what what way you, you you apply it, whether you use a flow form or a stirring machine or whatever, that's your call. Uh, I have no opinion about that. I can have an opinion what I would do, but so long as you're using the preparations and starting on that journey of learning what they are and how they work, that's what we have in common. But you've ultimately have to live. The consequences of your decision, so that's not a decision I can be involved in. And that was another thing my brother sort of pointed out that farmers are basically the last cohort in the world that actually have to stand in the marketplace and, in an economic sense, live and die on their, their choices. Mm. Yeah, nearly everyone else is on a salary. You know, these big corporate companies that work in you know, billions, still the guy at the top was on a salary. And if the, if the business tanks, he's, he's still walking away with a hefty salary, if not a bonus on top. Yeah. Yeah? Farmers can't do it. Yeah? The price, they've got to decide on the, on the moment, do they sell their wool or not sell their wool, or their beef or sheep or what have you. So um, that's a skill that has been lost. Yeah, and um, that that sense of individuality which is to me why there's a high suicide rate in the, in the agricultural sense because you you pushed into a corner and there's no one to turn to. Yeah, you're you're it, and your family and everyone else is is living the consequence of your decision. That's that's a pretty heavy responsibility. Yeah, and we're not schooled in that responsibility anymore. It's all, you know. I went to a dentist and he retired and so I went to another dentist and I got into what I call the, the new generation of dentists. And they wanted to put me on a plan and all this sort of regular stuff. And that's not me. You know, I, so I found myself another old dentist. But the problem is that <laughs> he'll retire before I, when I still need him. So I'm trying to scratch my head. How do I find my way to a dentist that's actually not a prescriptive dentist? Yeah. And it's the same with farmers. Like mm. we do workshops, and some people, their way of thinking is prescriptive, and so they want a prescription. 
which is, I understand, but in the end, they've got to stand back from the prescription and start to make decisions themselves. Well, it's just very in line with the way we teach our workshops, isn't it, Hamish? Yeah. We, we, you know, we, we say, um, here are practices. Um, you have a business, a current business, and these are potential future practices you can, you could apply. The important thing is to adapt them to your business in whatever way, whether it's a timing thing or, you know, um, a, a budget thing or, a, or whatever. So it's it's not it's not prescriptive. It's not you have to adopt this. It's it's an adaption process, isn't it? And that's coming back to you know children city. As I said, the, the knowledge of what good food tastes like mm. is probably the best thing you can teach your town children. And where do they go? They got to go to a good restaurant. Find out where the good restaurants are. Take them to like get food from farmers markets. Yeah, the farmers markets. I think the farmers markets is is the Australian sort of way to go because people are inherently social yeah um and i had a i had a mate you know i went to visit him and his wife had gone to, to vietnam so shopping with her her friends yeah and i had to laugh first of all that you know we, we, we were sent over to shoot them now our wives are going over there shopping mm. and what's why go there shopping you see if you go to a supermarket here it's in a plastic bag it's got a price um they're even doing away with the checkout chip yeah, mm. wherever there you go to the market, every every tomato, every lettuce is a negotiation with someone on the other side. Mm. Yeah, so you have an ego to ego experience, which actually enhances your humanity. Yeah, because that's what we are. Whereas if you just go to a checkout and grab all the stuff off the shelf, um, it's efficient, but it's a different soul experience. Yeah, and some people. Some people are looking for soul experiences, mm. not just physical substance. Mm. So we go off to Asia, where it's a whole cultural experience. Yeah. So we need to bring cultural experience back into our culture, and the farmers' markets is where is one of the places that it really is um, prospering, so to speak. And farmers love a yarn, you Absolutely. know. And they'll tell you all sorts of funny stuff, and they'll tell you how they how they grew it. And and I guess that you know, people buying that food should be asking. Better questions, I think they should. Yeah. It's about you know how did you grow up, where are you from, um, and get a sense of the love if there is, and and I trust that there has been love put into that into that sort of food. That's the sort of food we need to eat because that that that's the stuff that tastes tastes a whole lot better. Hamish, um, let's get to bushfires. Um, we're sort of you know, not well, not in the midst of it right now, uh, thankfully. Uh, but what what's you know how does uh, what's your thinking around you know the bushfires, maybe how they came to be, and and where biodynamics might fit into, not and not just bushfires, but Australian agriculture. It's sort of it's sort of spot in there. Well, um, after the Canberra bushfires a decade or so ago, um, um, Bill Gamage, who's a, an historian at the ANU, um, uh, sort of. The picture I gather, he, he looked at that as an historian and said, well, the First Nations people here wouldn't have been able to survive something like that. So what, what actually was the situation? So he went back to early white diaries, and what he found was that they all basically described a landscape that was like an English country gentleman's parkland. You know? There wasn't any dead timber lying around. It was quite clear some trees were planted over there on the high country, uh, others were on the low country. It was a very ordered landscape. And so um, he, he sort of drew together all these, these sort of observations and he's put into a book called The Biggest Estate on Earth, um, which is an academic's book. It's very interesting, a uh, lot of details in it and worth a read. And then um, Bruce Pascoe's written Dark Emu, which is another version of uh, more of a story of how Indigenous people looked after the landscape. So we came here, Leichhardt said, you know, organic matter, 30%, 40%. Um, human hovel, the Hume Highway was, was traceable because the, the, um, the tracks that the, the wagons left were so deep that it was easy to follow. You know? And the land between Lake George and Lake Bathurst, just sort of northeast of Canberra, um, was called rotten because the, the horses would sink to their fetlocks in it. Really? Yeah, it's like concrete now. Yeah? <laughs> so we have to look at it in context that we've come in and we've destroyed all that organic matter. And there's a wonderful book called 
the diary of a Welsh swagman. And this guy came to Australia in the 18, 1860 or thereabouts for 25 years. He, was, he kept a diary all his life. He came here when he was nearly 60. From, he was a, an award-winning Welsh farmer and a Welsh poet. Um, and he was a swaggy working on farms around Castlemaine, called Castlemaine, Victoria. So one of the few people who came here as an experienced farmer, and he came for two reasons, he said. One is to get away from his wife and the other was to see actually what was going on over here. <laughs> so he spent 25 years walking around all that country. And his, I mean, if I can su- summarise the book, basically he was saying, you know, the white people took six to 12 years to trash the land. You know, they came into this highly fertile country and just put sheep and cattle on it and, and um, took and took and took. And he said, they're not putting anything back. You know? And so... Coming back to the bushfires, we've, we've completely, um, in a way, let the land go for management. And it, our landscape's now a bit like um, teenagers going through puberty. It's chaos. Yeah. Yeah, there's no order to it. And so bushfires become part of the outcome because the land was managed using fire. Now um, the land manages us, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So then we we're in reaction, not response. Now within that, um, this is where I you know I keep my eye open and hopes. But after the Victorian bushfires, um, three things, three bits of anecdotal evidence came back that tweaked my interest. One is near Hillsville, the neighbour of one of the biodynamic farms. After it was all over, he said to his neighbour, "You know that's interesting. Where you put that stuff out didn't burn." Now, he has no idea about biodynamics or whatever, but he knew this guy was doing something different. So, but he also could see that where that stuff went out um, didn't burn. So that tweaks my interest. There was another uh, situation over near Kings Lake, King Lake where the fire came up the hill, got to the fence of the biodynamic people and stopped. So that's also interesting. And... Another one where the fire went through a vineyard and about 80% of the vineyard survived. Yeah? So these are things that, are things that I hope will get researched. You know, these are what I call scoping anecdotal evidence that should, because all research is all based on the question, get the question right. And what I anticipate research will show is that the bi- plants in a biodynamic environment are more mineral dense. That's why they're harder to digest. But you need you eat less of it, yeah, because it's more mineral dense. So anything that's more mineral dense is not going to, it's not as flammable. Yeah, yeah right. Yep. It's more mineral in it, less air. And in these latest bushfires up the north coast of New South Wales, um, you're talking to one or two fireys who I'm um, sort of just know socially. They were saying the trees, are, the, the trees in these bushfires are behaving totally differently. They're collapsing much earlier. Yeah, so to me. Connects into are they as mineral dense as they were? Yeah, you're right. And so are they because more, the, so- the soil isn't as healthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the trees, so the whole system is not as healthy. So when something does go wrong, um, um, it's like if our immune system is weak, we can catch something that when our, we wouldn't normally catch. Yeah, yeah. So we're catching bushfires that actually um, a generation ago we may not have caught. In the uh, catch a bushfire, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. Would it also stand to reason that, um, you know, the the the, the with a with a healthier soil, um, the plants are potentially more active and green, so they're less prone to burn. As we just because they're the moisture content of the soil and the, well, and the, and a fire, a fire. The friend over at Braidwood, he said, um, you know, he's he's into um, you know, sort of. Um, Peter Andrews and we, we, yeah, uh, natural sequence farming, natural, natural sequence farming, yeah. and he said we can name him. Okay, well, that Martin Royds, <laughs> who has who has country over there, um, he was telling me that the fire skimmed across his pasture because he had he had grass. Yeah, you know, it wasn't green, but it was, it was ground cover. But he said, you know, in the neighbourhood, the the soil caught fire. Yeah, because you see, you've got all this dead root matter that isn't being digested by the microbes in the soil. It's just growing that ends up like cardboard. So that actually caught fire under the soil. 
Yeah. So that should be a, a wake up call um, to the whole agricultural scene that actually we need to pay attention to what's under the soil if we want to actually help um, deal with bushfires. Well, it's a, it's, that's a fascinating way to put it because, you know, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for Australia, Australians, farmers, and even non farmers to contribute to um, the management of bushland and farmland that. Um, for the future that will um, uh, reduce and mitigate the chance of bushfire. But to, but to focus, you know, most people will go, what species need to be replanted or what management above ground needs to be done? But it's a great point that really it's going to start, like most things in the world, in life, starts with the soil. You know, get the soil right and then we can manage things above ground, whether that's different species or, you know, whatever, grazing or animals involved. But to start with the health of the soil, um, that's that's again what we need to you know talk to politicians about in terms of its, of its legislation that needs to be changed or it's it's the local land services or the government bodies to to focus on um, not just um, short term education or short term funding but longer term initiatives which focus on soil health you know and where and the outcomes will be potentially less fire prone better food better communities I mean, and just on the, on that soil and and um Bernie von Pine was one of the sort of early, early organic growers from the Darling Downs area in, in Queensland. And some people might remember back in 89, that was the first of the, the biological farmers of Australia held some field days around, around the countryside and hundreds of people turned up. You know, they expect a couple of hundred people, but 600,000 people came. Yeah. And Bernie was one of those, those elders that brought that about sort of thing. But I remember we were talking about this, and he said, "You know, the the dewfall is influenced by the aquifers. If we actually suck out the aquifers, we get less dew." And that was just again one of those observations that sort of stuck as it went in, to to um, because dew, even in drought, you'll get some dew, and if you've got a soil that's open, aerated, humic, then that little bit of moisture that's coming down the earth's breathing in is enough to keep the life in the soil going. You know, it mightn't produce vibrant plants pushing out of the ground, but it'll keep everything um, in a healthy, dormant state. So when you get some serious rain, it's all, it's all there ready to, ready to sprout again. Whereas if you've got a dead soil and it rains, it, it's all got to start from scratch. And, and again, on that point, you know, with dead soil, it's it's usually dead because um, it's exposed, you know, overgrazing, whether it's been ploughed and so on is another thing. But um, the result of rain falling on that sort of soil is it just goes sideways. There's erosion, you're not collecting water. Yeah. And, the, you know, as I keep saying, the best place for, for water to be used is where it lands. Yeah. In situ for that plant that has hopefully been left and not overgrazed for it to punch out some solar panels and start. start you know, and the, there's just a difference between the way – um, Peter Andrews sees it in the way I see it because I see it like that. He's trying to stop the weak, create weak, and what he's doing is brilliant. Mm. You know, but I, I take, I contribute another slice to it. Yeah, and that comes back to each individual farmer has to balance how how they manage all these different stories. Yeah, and that's that's exciting because everyone then in, has an individual operation. Yeah, that has a different mix of all these different uh, approaches. And again, the Maloon Institute um, is doing fantastic work on the political realm. You know, I'm, for me, the political space is not where I, where I have any interest because <clears throat> at one stage, my father was the chairman of the New South Wales Board of the AMP, so in the economic realm. My uncle was the Chief Justice of New South Wales and his cousin was the Foreign Minister. So I knew three people at the top of all three spectrum, all, all three areas. And um, I'm not saying they didn't achieve amazing things, but the limitations of being at the top were extraordinary. Everyone thinks you get to the top and you can change the world. But I observed these guys at the top. Um, it was as hard work changing it from the top as it was from the bottom. So I sort of resolved that my job is to change it from the, from the grassroots up, so to speak. I mean, getting more farmers doing it. Yeah. But I totally... What the Maloon Institute is doing is incredibly important too because we're getting to a stage where the politicians are sort of becoming open to it. Yeah. Yeah? 
Well, so I guess we they have to. Don't There's so much stuff going on. It's hard for them to. Well, well, they're, 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 res- they're, they're resistant to it. Like it's um, see, because you know, I don't want to go too far down that, but it's becoming more and more clear that the politicians are owned by someone else. Yeah, and it's that they're serving that. Yeah, and that's the that's the challenge and. We've just got to pick up the positive, and that's what I say. You know, Malone Creek is picking up the positive and going with that. Hey, Miss, let's talk um, one of your favourite topics: nutrition and mental health. What's the? Um, the summit's obvious. You know, there's lots of threads that join them. What do? You, what, how do you? How do you? What? What? What, what do you think about all? That? Well, <laughs> that could be a whole other podcast series in itself. Well, um, I worked in England with an organisation called the Black Swan Trust. And uh, that was a medical practice. It had a, an artistic therapy um, dimension and had a bakery and a garden. So I was in the bakery and cafe garden part. And the lead doctor said there that all mental illness has a physiological basis. Yeah, so I'm a very simple picture that's not sort of academically true. But if you, one of the things that I remember that uh, depression often is related to a liver that isn't functioning properly. Yeah? This is very simplistic, but I'll give you the image. Mm. So what now happens with mental health is they put these patients into a, a chemistry laboratory to work out what their liver is short of and then introduce that through tablets or injections or what have you so that they actually bring the, ba- the liver into balance and then they can be out on the street again. And that's all good until you realise that actually the outcome of that is the liver is going to get weaker because you're not actually stimulating the liver to produce whatever that chemical is. Yeah, so the doctors were saying to us in the food and garden, you know, the practical end, um, you won't see any effect. If, if If you're successful with giving people better food and whatever, you won't see the result because as soon as we see any benefit, we'll drop the medication. So their job... From their perspective, their job was to drop the medications, but they could only drop the medications as we could pick it up with the nutrition. Yeah? So that comes back to biodynamic food essentially is harder to digest yeah? because when we digest food, we actually uncreate it. You know, we have to pull it all apart. And if it's, if it's put together pretty solidly, you've got to work hard to, to um, pull it apart, but that working hard strengthens your organs. Yeah. So again, it comes back to the way the food is grown is is very important. And I guess that also links to processed food is generally sort of highly processed and broken down and so it's easy to digest, which isn't isn't helping our organs to become stronger and it's, and and it's, that, it's empty. That is an appropriate place for a medicine because if you're sick and weak, say then you need to be given a medicine that is broken down so you can actually pick up and build up your strength again. So you move from the medicine back to the food at the pace you can do it. So in a medicinal sort of managed by a physician, your doctor, um, that's a different story to just eating food that's slop. Yeah. Yeah, because then you've got, it's under, under management, so to speak, the process. And you have a, um a phrase that um, about what you eat. Run us through that, Hamish. Oh, yeah. There are phrases that we sleep through, so to speak. And how many times do you hear someone say, you are what you eat? Yeah. It's, it's so obvious that you, it just passes through your brain. You, know, you can be totally asleep. But actually try reversing it. And uh, when I was working in the bakery in Sydney in Glebe, um, if I was ever feeling pretty crappy, um, my nose would take me out the bakery, down the Glebe Point Road, into the hamburger joint. Yeah, that's where my nose would nest. When I was, when I was feeling rubbishy, my nose would take me to the hamburger joint. So over, over a period of a few years, I, I ran this trial on myself. And so I'd buy a hamburger and you know, go back. And half an hour later, an hour later, I'd be feeling much worse. Yeah, in the, in the first 20 minutes, I'd feel great. Um, you were satisfied. Sort of it satisfied yeah. something, but then it actually didn't nourish. So another time I'd you know, feel crappy, I'd go down, I'd go into the hamburger joint, and then I'd sort of 
pick myself up by the scruff of the neck and then walk back out of the hamburger shop and take myself up to the greengrocer shop and buy an apple or something, yeah? And the apple was never as good as the hamburger. But an hour or so later, I was feeling a lot better. So, you know, it's sort of when you're feeling rubbishy, you're more likely to eat rubbishy food. So you actually eat what you are. Um, so that comes back to what can we do as children in the city is actually um, make them very attentive in a practical sense um, of taste and quality. And you know, when they're feeling crappy, make sure you give them something um, substantial rather than just um, give in to giving them a lolly or quick fix. You know, a quick fix. Because ultimately the quick fix will, will snowball into a long fix. Short, yeah. short, short term um, word. Yeah, you, you, it's a short term uh, fix for, for, for a lot long term pain, though. Isn't yeah, it? You, yeah. You, you're, just, you're just delaying the inevitable. And again, you know, we put the preparations, the soil preparations go out in the afternoon when the earth's breathing in, the silica ones, the atmospheric ones in the morning when the earth's breathing out. But you see, that's a reflection of our own. Physiology, our liver stores sugar from three o'clock in the afternoon to three o'clock in the morning, sort of, and from three o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon, it gives out sugar. Yeah. And so when you've got small children, particularly who are still acclimatizing to an earthly body, um, that's not always working as it might. So you get children who get cranky sometime mid afternoon. Well, instead of trying to run the discipline, path, you can actually start to run the nutrition path and make sure that you give them a bit of fruit or something that is, that is sort of providing a bit of sugar to give the, give the liver a boost. Yeah, so that, um, and you'll find if you, can, if you can find your way into the nutritional rhythms and give children an appropriate food in an appropriate time, um, that's really helpful. And as I say, all kids are the same. They'll all go for the lolly. Yeah. And it's a, one of those strange things that lollies the the, the really worst foods are a treat. I know. <laughs> How do we get away from that? It's like it's, a it's, broccoli milkshake is something they should be loving. <laughs> that should be the treat. <laughs> and it, it's just one of the one of the one of the quirky bits of being human that that the um, bad things are the treats. Yeah? And in a certain sense, going back to my own childhood, I could probably I could probably with reasonable accuracy, not total, sort of you know, my grandmother would be able to produce something that wasn't rubbishy, um, but it was a treat. Yeah. And I think that's, there's more of a consciousness around that. I think that, you know, there's lots of, you know, especially mums and, you know, women who are um, potentially more um, aware of this because, you know, that they, they, they're nurturers and so they're a bit more aware of this. And, they, and there are lots of good recipes and books out there and websites and stuff. Um, and it's not hard to find where people are, um, like Alex, Alex Stewart, for instance, on Low Tox Life, you know, she's got some great recipes um, in her book and, and online and so on where you can still, children can still have treats, but they're good treats. And, and, and in those, you know, opportunities, you have to, um, to change the way they think. And, what, and, and, and something I always go back to is what is, what is, what is normal? What, what should be or could be or needs to be the new normal? You know, it should be normal for kids to have a treat which is a nutritious, yummy thing as opposed to a, a lolly or something. And it's, you know, it should be, you know, normal for farmers to be considering their environment, their ecology, and um, I'd love it if it was normal for, for, for farmers to be using biodynamics. That'd be, that'd be a wonderful thing because I can't see any, uh, any, any downside to that. Just if I can pick up on that, there was about five years ago, time gets away, might have been 10 years ago, but there was a whole rash of programs on TV about the um, the food police, you know, they'd come in. On t- there's a television program. They'd come in, you know, pull all your stuff out of your kitchen cupboards right. and put it on the sink uh, on the table and look at how terrible it was, you know, sort of. And and there's another one getting teenagers to clean their rooms and you know, do chores around the house. And then oh, yeah. the counterpart to that on Sundays they'd go for a walk or a bike ride as a family, and all that sort of trying to sort of portray that. And one of them was. Um, they got a family in Manchester who was just, you know, your, your supermarket shopping family, uh, two teenage daughters, and they matched with a family down in Devon, which is the new agey sort of hippie uh, organic part of England. 
and um, they got them to swap uh, lifestyles. Yeah. So the people in Devon had to buy all their food from the supermarket. Were they still living in their own home? They're still, still living in their own home, okay. but they had to buy all their food from the supermarket. Yeah. 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 And the people in Manchester or Birmingham, whichever it was, had to yeah, they got a they got uh, you know, an organic box scheme and yes. everything had to be um, organic, yeah, cooked accordingly. And um, it was quite amazing because first of all, in the Birmingham or Manchester ones, the two teenage daughters, as soon as a box of food arrived, you know, raw, you know, carrots, lettuce, potatoes, whatever arrived, they got interested. What do we do with this stuff? Yep. So they actually engaged in the kitchen. Um, and they, you know, the mother by the midweek, you know, all, all sort of women's pains and whatever, the headaches had all gone. She was feeling fantastic, you know. They were all healthier, happier at the end of the week, and they actually saved money. They could buy two extra bottles of wine on the same budget that they'd always had. Yeah. Yeah, and they felt a whole lot better. They, they were eating together. Even with the two extra bottles of wine, it, they felt better. Yeah. So, <laughs> um <laughs> And then they looked at the, the bunch in Devon yeah. and their, the social fabric of their family fell apart totally. Yeah, you know, they right. started to get sick and grumpy and, and um, you know, they couldn't wait till the end of the week to actually <laughs> junk the Finish. experiment. Yeah, yeah. And they ended up spending, I think, an extra £25 on their food, on their food bill. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but you see, th those programs disappeared. And this is the big problem. Bring um, them back. Well, this is the big problem, actually, who's running the government because those things don't – it's like food labelling, you know, labelling the amount of sugar in products and yeah. all this sort of stuff. There's, there's yeah, so man. much um, – you, you just watch what people buy in their supermarket trolley yeah, and the amount of stuff that really everyone's a loser on. Yeah? And, and, and that's a good point. I mean, the there's a lot of criticism. Well, you always hear criticism about oh, organic food costs a whole lot, lot more. Well. Maybe it does, but what you, you, we've got to look at the whole shopping trolley, not just the organic component or the fruit and veg components. Like, what other crap are you buying? The, the, and the, the medical bills that come with it. Well, that's right, yeah. So yeah. there's the indirect sort of costs and there's the, the, of, of, of ill health and then there's the direct costs of, of buying um, uh, processed food, which some would say, oh, it's a lot cheaper. Well, yeah, no, well, if it is cheaper, you need a whole lot more of it to be satisfied and it's just doing you no good at all and it takes away – that engagement with, as as you know, Rudolf Steiner talks about the internal cultivation, your 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 re relationship with food in the kitchen, as a, in terms of its preparation. I mean, what ripping up a packet of food and pouring it in a bowl and putting some milk on it, there's just no engagement there at all. Yeah. Know? Well, uh, uh, Christos Miliotis, who's a mate of mine, is in the medical sort of circuit. He um, was telling me a, a character he knows who is an IT person he's not in agriculture or what have you but he's he started to get diabetes yeah and so being it he, he did his google search dr google search <laughs> and um you know did it in a certain amount of detail and he came to the conclusion that just he moved himself to unprocessed food not organic just unprocessed food as a starting point yeah. yep. and, and diabetes sort of departed so um yeah, just just doing something simple like going to unprocessed food can be massive. <clears throat> and that was just one guy. Yeah. We all have to do our own research. We all have our own body. We all are responsible for doing our own research. And too many of us, self included, leave it to other people. Yeah. So um yeah, that's we've all eventually we've all got to stand up for what we stand for. Before we leave, Hamish, we've been um, we're coming to the end here and talking. I'm getting quite hungry thinking about that um, bacon in the fridge and the veggies in the garden down there. Um, just to make a note that you know this podcast is is is, is been um, made possible. This first series by Landcare Australia, who we we did mention um, there before. So I just want to acknowledge that, and you know, there in itself is a wonderful network for um, you know helping farmers understand and apply the new normal that we're talking about. And it's not necessarily and think, Landcare Australia's mission to, to talk about nutrition, but there are, you know, there are links that I think um, there's opportunity to explore. You know, they, they, they was involved with one of their previous campaigns, um, uh, Farm to Fork, you know, which is about identifying the benefits of food. So it's not, not 
it's not that it's not on their radar. And I think, you know, um, a lot of land care groups are planting a lot of trees, which is wonderful. I think if there's is an opportunity for land care as a network on ground to start engaging uh, around a bit more around nutrition, you know, that, that it's not just about trees, it's about the soil and it's about the food that's been produced. And we want farmers to actually be happy to eat the food they're producing. Look, I, I think, um, you know, as land care has got sort of identified with trees, yeah, and that's that's great, but actually it's land care. It's the whole of the land, not just trees. And we got a grant back on back in the day for planting fifteen thousand trees and it wasn't a land care grant, but it was we were informed by the whole land care experience as to how to use the grant, so to speak. So, you know, land care is an amazing thing, but as you say, it's not it's the soil, nutrition, um and the the other wonderful potential of land care is the whole collaboration thing. Yeah. Yeah. And collaboration implies diversity, and diversity implies sometimes difficult relationships. You know, we have great differences. And so we've actually got to develop the skill to actually celebrate difference and collaborate so that we end up with something that's actually in total. The land care is diverse, and we've got people growing all sorts of different things. Well, it's just like biodiversity, isn't it? We, we're looking for biodiversity underground in terms of our biota and the fungus and the bacteria and the viruses and all that sort of things, but it's also the, the diversity of biology um, above ground in the communities that we're, yeah. we're engaged in. And some of the stuff that Biodynamics works, you know, as, as our basic assumption on the tools of trade, is still in the scientific realm sort of heresy you know, or very out there. But you see, if you, if you follow the work of Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo and all that bunch back in what 15, 1600s. It was only in 1948 or thereabouts that the Catholic Church sort of um, took them off the heresy list. You know, so um, these things, depending who's controlling the, 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 the levers of power, um, sometimes they're way behind where the action is. And where the, yeah? where the, where the people are, the belief system of yeah, the so, population. And, there were steps along the way, and I can't remember them all, but you know, until, until the mid-1800s, from the Catholic Church's point of view, all that stuff was heresy. Yeah? But now we take that for granted, the, the Copernican worldview and what have you. Whether that's you know, right or wrong is a separate question. But, so what we're working with in quite a lot of the sort of, um, scientific realm, they have as much problem with what we're talking about, and I understand it because it's it's something that we haven't actually been brought up with, yeah. And that's the the time we're going through, and it's nothing new. There was always the heretics, so to speak, um, and the heretics weren't always right. Uh, ah. Yeah. So that's why, even though in the biomimic spectrum we're trying to um, lay out a different way of looking at things, we also have to be fairly modest that we're not always right either. And that's why we need collaboration. Um, and that's why I find the most exciting thing you know, working with you because you work as a whole diverse, what I call it this morning, you're a sort of, um, <laughs> we have to find a new word for this, but it's a regenerative social entrepreneur you know, helping Absolutely. make all this happen. Yeah. yeah? Because um, it's very difficult. If you're the farmer, you really can't be away from the farm for very long. You need to be actually, because you lose you lose those you lose those sensory those subtle sensory um, markers that are that are really key to making sure you're ahead of the action. So you're ahead of it rather than reacting, and that requires presence. Yeah. Well, um, Hamish, that's probably a good point to leave on. Thank you for your presence here today. We've just had a, a wonderful week together in Victoria. Um, lots of really interesting, good stuff down there. People who haven't had much interest in or well, experience with it, with uh, biodynamics, um, uh, getting on board, understanding it, really enjoying it, um, and that's what we're going to keep on doing. So, um, just a little little plug for what Hamish and I do. We run, uh, we facilitate and organise um, biodynamic workshops, two day introduction biodynamics workshops. We've, we've run advanced biodynamics workshops before. Um, Running, our plan is to run a few, um, uh, a few um, uh, different ones as well. 
Uh, we ran the um, projected, uh, geometry. projected geometry here last year. Um, so yeah, check out um, uh, my website um, uh, for details on those those things. And you know, it's such good fun getting out, you know, to other different parts of Australia, and you know, getting to know those landscapes and and introducing biodynamics to those people in those landscapes. And and it's really um, it's really exciting stuff. And I'm very clear. Like I teach biodynamics, you know, as as a as a form of agriculture that, that is based on spiritual science. But I teach sort of that. But it's very important for the farmers to go and do a permaculture course, um, mm. you know, a natural sequence farming course, Elaine Ingham's work. You know, I teach one thread. It's very important that all the farmers and gardeners. Uh, study different threads and then weave their own fabric. If I start to teach across the spectrum, everyone go home confused. So I, I teach one thing, you know, Peter Andrews teaches another. That's the way it should be as far as that's the diversity. Um, and then each individual goes home and um, pulls all these threads together into their particular fabric. I think the good news, is, and, and then just to finish on, is that I guess to, to clarify that is that biodynamics, you know, my, has been my experience and it's definitely my understanding is can be applied in any situation. So one can be doing permaculture, you know, and, and doing their, their you know, landscape and their, their property plans. One can be, um, uh, you know, getting stuck into natural sequence farming, um, centropic even, farming. Even people who are high-tech chemical, um, I really encourage them to add the preparations because yeah. then they'll see something will change that can help them figure out how they can reduce their chemicals. So. Yeah. In my school of biodynamics, the way I, I like to try, is whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, add the biodynamic preparations and then follow the results. Yeah? And for some people, things happen magic and quick. Other people, it's a slow, it's a slow graft. Yeah? But that's, again, where we need to also to come together as a community and share experiences and share what's worked and what hasn't worked because that's, the real, that's where the real learning happens. Practice and sharing, practice and sharing practice and sharing. That's how we'll grow it. Well, Hamish, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Um, I trust everyone got a glimpse of, uh, of Hamish's regenerative journey. Um, I'm getting hungry. The wind's getting up a bit. And, and I've got uh, to go to Sydney. You've got to go to Sydney. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Hamish. That was wonderful. Thank you, Charlie. And, and again, congratulations. I think um, it, was a, it was an award well earned and well used. That's a Bob Hawke um, uh, uh, Lancaster Australia Award. Um, and thank you to Lancaster Australia and uh, um, for uh, affording that to. And there'll be a new one. There'll be a new uh, um, holder of that award or, um, in 2020, later this year. Um, if if that happens, if I hope you if, have if, hand a, 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 <laughs> a really and, uh, good you know carrot onto them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I'll be and I'll be there to support them, whoever that person is. So um, uh, looking forward to that. Thanks, Hamish. Great stuff. Thanks, good Charlie. You. Thank you, everyone. There you go, um, sitting there in the garden, Hannah Minow, speaking with Hamish Mackay. Not sure I enjoy anything more, to be honest. Um, lovely fella and um, uh, has been a wonderful mentor for me and continues to be. And uh, I trust that this interview, the interview you just heard with Hamish, inspires you to at least look at look at biodynamics in a different way and even come along to one of our workshops. We will be rolling out quite a few in um, autumn 2021 and spring again. So jump on uh, my website, charliearnett.com.au, check out the dates and get yourself to one of our courses. Um, I don't think you'll regret it. Now, talking about not no regrets, next week's interview is with Chris Eggett. Uh, fellow I went to university with, a lovely, lovely guy, one of my favourite interviews with Chris, such a humble man um, on a family farm, dairy farm at Warhope and I can't tell you how much I learned and how transformative his journey has been since university um, through to um, where he is now. He, and anyway, you'll just have to wait till next week to listen to it all. Some of the practices that he has created and he's implementing, he's, he's, a, he's adapted to his farm and his dairy and the quality of his milk is absolutely outstanding. Um, he's a real sleeper, it's Chris Eggert, because he knows a lot of stuff and I think we need to get that out there. So... Look forward to that next week. We see you. This episode has been brought to you by the magical world of biodynamics. Earth, planets, the cosmos and beyond 
Biodynamics, the healing tincture of nature's song. Distills and imbues direct from the source, giving back the soil, enriching life force. A dance of the divine through light, space and time, bringing back to balance you, the landscape and world combined. This podcast is produced by Reese Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.